So we have this situation, uh, I would say in the Anglo-American world in particular, of um, <clears throat> public spokesmen for, for neo-Darwinism making very dogmatic claims about the certainty we have associated with the contemporary theory of evolution. I was testifying at a state board of education hearing in the big state of Texas in uh, 2009, and I'd been called there to testify because the legislators there were considering a provision to teach the strengths and weaknesses of scientific theories as a pedagogical innovation in science education. And folks from a group called the National Center for Science Education came and said, well, the theory of evolution should be exempted from that, uh, from that standard because there are no weaknesses in the theory of evolution. Um, in challenge to that, we put forward just a little binder of about 100 peer-reviewed scientific articles from leading biological journals in which major problems with the standard neo-Darwinian theory of evolution were in fact being noted in the scientific literature. Um, those problems could also be construed as weaknesses. Uh, the famous statement from, from uh, uh, Professor Dawkins uh, that it's absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person's, person is either ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked, but he graciously agrees not to actually consider that one. Um, and it's not surprising that these kinds of dogmatic statements make it into the media. The uh, uh, New York Times science writer, Cornelia Dean, has essentially parroted this kind of perspective that there is no credible scientific challenge to the theory of evolution as an explanation for the complexity and diversity of life. And almost all of the major science organizations in America have public statements stating the same thing. No controversy, says the NAS. Uh, no significant controversy about the validity of the theory of evolution, says the AAAS, the National Association of Biology Teachers, similar statements. And uh, my favorite is from a guy I actually really, really like and have had the uh, good pleasure of uh, interacting with in many debates and conversations, Michael Ruse, but at one moment of weakness, Michael said, in frustration perhaps, evolution is a fact, 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 with all caps and an exclamation point. Now, in contrast to the sometimes rhetorical excesses of some of Darwin's modern public defenders, Darwin himself was famously modest in his rhetorical style and, um, and actually expressed very significant doubts about the theory that he was developing in The Origin of Species uh, as he was developing the argument for it. He acknowledged the counter-arguments and, and the ones that gave him pause. And the most important doubt that he expressed in the, uh, was about an event in the history of life called the, uh, at that time, it was called the Silurian explosion. It wasn't, I don't know that they had the term explosion, but it was in the Silurian period. It later became renamed the Cambrian period, and so we now refer to this event as the Cambrian explosion. And it is the Cambrian explosion refers to the geologically sudden appearance of most of the major groups of animals or the major animal body plans. And a body plan is a unique combination of body parts, organs, and tissues, a unique arrangement of body parts and tissues. And in the Cambrian, there were many, many new body plants that suddenly arose. In Darwin's time, there were four or five of the main groups, the trilobites, an early form of arthropods, the brachiopods, and several others that were known well from the fossil record of Cambrian uh, animals that was uh, that, that he had explored with one of his mentors, Adam Sedgwick, in, over in Wales. But the, our knowledge of the Cambrian animals and, and the number of different animals that have, were first present in the fossil record has grown in the ensuing years. Um, there are a number of different ways of counting the animal groups, but the, in the hierarchical classification system, the highest level of classification in the animal kingdom is the phyla. And the higher up the classification system, the larger the differences, the bigger the differences in form. And the, um, one of the best counts of animal phyla is one that uh, um, 
Doug Irwin at the Smithsonian has developed, and, and uh, we've developed our own count, and we got about the same number, 37 animal phyla in the history of life. 27 of those, uh, actually 36, 26 of those are represented somewhere in the fossil record. 10 have, have no, no representation in the fossil record, but of those 26 in the fossil record, fully 20 of those phyla make their first appearance in the Cambrian. So it's a very significant period of innovation and form. And as we'll see, it happened very rapidly. And so um, when we think of the Cambrian, perhaps the archetypal form is the trilobite. And these are really fascinating creatures. Um, I was just given by one of my um, research assistants a beautiful uh, collection of Cambrian trilobites in one piece of rock. And one of them had was fossilized, kind of curled up in, in the way a pill bug or a potato bug would curl up when it was under pressure. And you can see in this particular fossil the, the structure of the compound eye. And I, I knew paleo, uh, Cambrian experts talk about the importance of the compound eye. It's a very complex structure, and it's present in the Cambrian from the very dawn of animal life. But this was the first fossil sample that I had seen myself with my own eyes of that beautiful structure, and it's, it's very impressive indeed. And so Darwin was aware of the, the sudden appearance of these animals. The other group that, that was very common in the fossil record in Wales were the brachiopods, these, uh, these bivalves, the, the two shells, and a, a very intricate internal uh, structure as well. So the Cambrian uh, is a, a period in the Paleozoic, and it's the very beginning of the Paleozoic, and the explosion takes place. We now have it dated through radiometric means at about 530 million years ago is the beginning of this uh, explosion. And I'll tell more about, about just how rapid that is. Um, the current uh, best date is based on uh, a, a beautiful Cambrian find in, in China, in southern China. And using zircon crystals, they've been able to date, uh, geochronologists have been able to date the period of the explosion at about five to six million years which sounds like an awful lot of time from the standpoint of a human lifespan. But I like to say that the uh, Cambrian explosion is not only biologically, or is not only geologically sudden, it's biologically sudden. And what I mean by that is this. In uh, Darwinian theory, neo-Darwinian, modern neo-Darwinian theory, there is a mathematical expression of the theory known as population genetics. And pop the equations of population genetics allow us to calculate how much time, how much change we would expect to, to see happen if we knew certain basic factors, mutation rates, generation times, uh, sizes of populations, and the like. And a, a population genetics analysis suggests that the amount of biological form and information that arises in the Cambrian um, should not happen within five to six million years. In fact, when the Cambrian was still dated as a 40 million year event, it was still regarded from an evolutionary standpoint as essentially the blink of an eye. And so this is really a very significant event in the history of life and one which um, requires some explanation. So uh, I love this figure because it's, uh, it kind of captures the concept of the Cambrian explosion in, in, uh, in, in one picture. On the right we have the sedimentary strata. These are probably not going as far down as Cambrian, but this is conceptual. On the left, we have the, the geologic time scale as represented in millions of years. And then we have some representative groups that first arose in the Cambrian. And the little, the little uh, yellow stuff there represents the rapidity of that, the explosive character of the, ex of, of the explosion. So what we're talking about is the sudden appearance in the sedimentary column of animal forms, okay? So here's the question, why did this explosion of animal life give Darwin pause? And um, by the way, how much time do we have today? Because there's a number of different ways I could go with this talk, and I want to make sure we get to the most important stuff. Sorry. Anyway, um, so the Cayman explosion did not challenge the notion of evolution in the first sense that uh, Ard talked about this morning, the idea of change over time or natural history. 
uh, if we think of evolution in that sense, the Cambrian explosion is, is actually confirming of it because it shows that life was different a long time ago than it is today. And that's one of the most basic meanings of evolution. So uh, the, uh, and, and another sense of, well, anyway, so evolu we can define evolution in a number of different ways. And one way to define it is change over time. And certainly the Cambrian explosion documents that there has been change over time. Another meaning of evolution is the idea of universal common descent. That all of the animal forms and plant forms that we see on the earth today have descended through a process of slow, gradual modification, starting from one, or as Darwin put it, one or very few simple forms at the base of the tree of life. And Darwin's tree picture, his, the tree of life picture of the history of life, was his way of depicting this idea of universal common descent, where the very base of the tree represents the first, presumably one-celled, simple organism, and all the branches on the tree at the top represent the, uh, the, the forms of life that exist today. The branches that don't quite make it are the ones that represent extinct animal forms. Now there's a third meaning of evolution as well, and that's the idea that natural selection acting on random variations, we would now say mutations, but Darwin didn't know about that in his day, um, is the, as he put it, the chief cause of change. And in particular, the mechanism of natural selection in a Darwinian perspective is thought to account for the origin of new biological form and the appearance of design that biological forms manifest. Uh, Darwin, in the third chapter of The Origin, used the uh, an analogy to artificial breeding to show how natural selection could do what a human breeder could do. It could do what an intelligent agent could do. So if you're a sheep herder in the north of Scotland and you want a woollier breed, you choose the woolliest male and the woolliest female. You allow them to breed and, after, and then you do that generation after generation. And, and human breeders knew that you could change the features of, of, a, of a group of organisms through that process. After many generations, you could get a woollier breed of sheep. Uh, to, to adapt the illustration a little bit, Darwin didn't use sheep, but he used something similar. You know, if you had a series of very cold winters, the Darwinian perspective would be, you would have all but the woolliest die out in each winter, and you would have the same effect. A woollier breed of sheep in a cold climate, so the sheep are well adapted to their climate. So adaptation which previously biologists had thought was a striking evidence of design, is now explained by a purely natural mechanism. Thus the term natural selection in contrast to artificial selection. So part of what Darwin was trying to explain was not just the origin of form or new features of animals, but also this appearance of design. Uh, in any case, the nature of his mechanism, as he understood it, had to act very slowly. If big changes occurred, they were likely to be catastrophic or deleterious, and so he understood that natural selection acted on small, minute variations, and therefore he assumed that the mechanism would take a great deal of time. So if we step back and look at the Cambrian explosion in the light of these two meanings of evolution that are distinctively Darwinian, we can see why the Cambrian explosion challenged Darwin's theory. His, he said his book was one long argument for descent, universal common descent with modification. That's the process of natural selection. And on the basis of that slow, gradually acting process and his tree-like picture of the history of life, we'd, look, we'd expect a gradual unfolding of living form. But what we find with the Cambrian animals is not so much a tree-like picture, but something more like a lawn, or maybe a better depiction would be something like an orchard in which things suddenly appear and then there's variation within the, the, the limits of those animal groups. So this is very schematic, but if you look at the origin of animals, in a Darwinian view, we'd expect this kind of gradual unfolding. There would be the, the, the gold disks are the animals that exist in the fossil record, and the idea would be in the lower strata beneath the Cambrian, you'd expect to see animals that were precursors to those that were not quite the same, but had some of the same uh, features that showed that they were evolving toward those, those more complex creatures. Problem is, the pre-Cambrian strata have not obliged, or did not oblige in Darwin's time, uh, and didn't show those creatures. So the, the fossil record looks more like this, conceptually, versus this. And so you have this tension between the discontinuity of the record 
and the continuous picture of the unfolding of life as expected, uh, both because of Darwin's mechanism, which he thought would work very slowly and gradually, and because of the way he uh, understood the history of life as a branching tree. So in The Origin, Darwin discusses this at some length and says uh, this. He says the following. He says, to the question as to why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods prior to the Cambrian system, I can give no satisfactory answer. And then he goes on to say that the case at present must remain inexplicable and may be truly urged as a valid argument against the view here entertained. And so that's Darwin's doubt. Now, all, like all good scientists, Darwin didn't leave the, the matter there. And he was already thinking about a way of, of remedying this problem or solving this, this difficulty within the framework of his own theory. And, and so, as I dis discuss in the book the mystery of the Cambrian explosion, I discuss two mysteries. The first is the mystery of the missing ancestral fossils, and I want to talk about that for a few minutes, and then we'll talk about the second mystery, which is the mystery of how to build an animal. Okay? But Darwin was what actually not only acknowledged the doubt, but he was the first person to propose a way of addressing it. And uh, I've ex uh, excerpted here from a longer passage where Darwin likens the history of life very poetically. It's beautifully written. Um, he likens the history of life to a story in which we have a few chapters here and there, and in some of the chapters we have all, only a few pages. And then he says that, he says, I look at the natural geological record as the history of the world, imperfectly kept. On this view, the difficulties above, meaning the missing ancestral forms to the Cambrian, um, are greatly diminished. And so Darwin is expecting that subsequent fossil finds will fill in those gaps, and his um, and the Cambrian explosion will eventually look a lot less explosive, and that's what he's... So, but for now, he says, the explanation for the Cambrian explosion is the imperfection of the fossil record. Now, there was a leading paleontologist in the day, in the 19th century, whose good opinion Darwin very much wanted to secure, and he sent him a copy of the first edition of The Origin across the Atlantic. Uh, Louis Agassiz, paleontologist was, a, in fact, a European. He was Swiss, trained under the great uh, naturalist Cuvier, but he came to America and took up residence at Harvard University. Stephen Jay Gould, who later uh, became perhaps the most famous American paleontologist of the 1970s, 80s, 90s, uh, later held the Agassiz chair at Harvard. So Agassiz was, um, had a long legacy and was quite renowned, especially in his day, but he was skeptical of not only Darwin's theory, but he was especially skeptical of Darwin's attempt to explain away the missing fossils in the Cambrian. And it wasn't because Agassiz doubted that the fossil record was imperfect, but he said the problem with Darwin's explanation is the, that he invokes a kind of selective... Um, it's not that there are missing fossils. He says that the fossils are selectively missing. They're only missing at those places which we would really need them to be to confirm Darwin's theory. In other words, uh, here's the quote from Agassiz, and I'll, then I'll explain. He says, Darwin's theory rests, Agassiz says, partly on the assumption that in this succession of ages, just those transitional types have dropped out of the, from the fossil record, which would have proved the Darwinian conclusions had these types been preserved. And uh, you, you can see here... Uh, a depiction of the tree of life. This is actually a representation, or it's actually a fossil display, representation of a fossil display that was at the uh, California Academy of Sciences. And uh, the, the dots represent uh, animals, and the strata represent Cambrian layers. This was a Cambrian explosion display. And when you went into the museum, there were these interesting magnifying glasses over the connection points, the nodes. And Agassiz's point, and, and you know, I was there one time for a seminar, but the ki kids were going through the museum. And they go and look at all these fossils, and, but they always put their noses right in the magnifying glasses because they wanted to see what was under the glass. And can you, can you guess what was under the glass? Yeah, nothing, okay? And they expected to find something, but that was the, and, and this was Agassiz's point. 
The fossil record is actually very complete in its representation of these major animal groups through many layers, many major uh, er periods of geologic time. But where we're missing the fossils, it's not in the terminal branches of the tree of life, but always in the internal branches or at the nodes. And so he said, if the explanation for the missing fossils is that the, is that the fossil record is incomplete, why is it only incomplete at those connecting points which be, would be necessary to establish the tree of life picture of the history of life? And so he, Agassiz remains skeptical to his, day, to, to the, his dying day. Um, now, his skepticism, however, was really dwarfed by the enthusiasm in a younger generation of naturalists who very quickly adopted the Darwinian view. Um, there were later doubts about Darwinism uh, in the early 19th century about the mechanism of natural selection, but um, Agassiz was kind of left behind. And it, historians of science who write about Agassiz's life treat him as, as a, an anachronism, or as a, sorry, as a, uh, someone who was kind of too wedded to a philosophical viewpoint to, to catch the wave of the new Darwinian science. In any case, the mystery of the Cambrian explosion progressively deepened. And in 1909, there was a major fossil find in, Burgess, uh, in the Burgess Shale in Western Canada. It's uh, in a, near a town called Field in British Columbia. And there was a, uh, an American paleontologist from the Smithsonian named Walcott, Charles Doolittle Walcott, who was excavating or looking for fossils there. He made a major find of, of Cambrian uh, era fossils in this dark colored shale. And uh, it just was extraordinary. And uh, Stephen Gould has uh, lionized this event in his book, Wonderful Life. Conway Morris has written about it. The two of them take a little different view of things. But uh, the one thing that was indisputable is that it didn't help resolve the Cambrian mystery in that many, many more forms of animal life were, were discovered than had been known before in the Cambrian, but the pre-Cambrian strata still failed to document those, pre those ancestral forms that we expected to find. And here's a couple of very beautiful Cambrian fossils. This one uh, called Morella is a lace crab, beautiful intricate structures that were preserved, beautifully preserved. This is another guy called Waptia with a head shield, and an articulated um, body plan, a kind of crustacean, and there's lots more of wonderful pictures and, uh, and creatures from this uh, bird of shale. I have a few visual aids. This was a little, I, I went to the, actually hiked to the top and saw the fossils, but they sold these cool little models in the gift shop. This is a guy uh, called Wewaxia. It was a famous uh, arthropod, called, arthropod called an animalocarid. This is a, I'll show a picture of him from China in a minute, but he's a meter long. And a strange thing called Opabinia, with no, oop, got him upside down, five eyes, I kid you not, and this long proboscis, and it, just extraordinarily strange creatures. So the problem that these, the fossil finds of the Burgess presented was that not only did we not document the, 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 the ancestral forms we expected to find, but we now had a lot more disparity of form, a lot more new forms of life that were also lacking ancestral precursors in the previous, in the lower strata. And so the explosion, in a sense, got more explosive. There were other problems that paleontologists ended up talking about, something called a top-down pattern of appearance rather than a bottom-up. But in the interest of time, I'll press on. Another big discussion. Oh, Walcott, interesting guy. Walcott knew Agassiz as a young man, sold him fossils, but he sided with the Englishman, Darwin, on the question of the origin of animals, and expected that the that the uh, the animal the, the missing ancestral forms would turn up. He came up with an ingenious explanation for why they weren't there, called the artifact hypothesis. And the idea was that these were most of the Cambrian forms were marine invertebrates, and so he suggested that that all the evolution was taking place when the sea level had receded, and so the trilobites were busy evolving, busy evolving, and then as the sea level rose and covered the continental craton, uh, then 
when they died, they were suddenly, it looked as if they had suddenly evolved, but they were really only just suddenly deposited because of the rise in sea level. This is called the artifact hypothesis. The idea was that the missing fossils were an artifact of our sampling of this, this event. Okay? Now, that hypothesis was pretty much the dominant view of, of what had happened until oil companies started to drill core drill cores into sedimentary rock. And for two reasons, it very quickly became apparent that Walcott's hypothesis didn't work. One, the sedimentary layers did not reveal the expected ancestors of the Cambrian fossils. And secondly, when plate tectonics came along, we realized that the, the, uh, the age of marine sediments only went back to the Jurassic to about 180 million years ago. They, because in plate tectonics, the crustal materials continuously being recycled. Nothing in the marine sedimentary environment is older than about the Jurassic period. Nothing is, goes back to the Cambrian. And so for a couple reasons, Walcott's explanation of the missing fossils went by the boards. Now, the mystery got even deeper in the 1980s and 90s. There was a major find in southern China in a near a place called Chengjiang. The fossil formation is called the Maoshishan Shale, and it's a uh, um, a wonderful site, and uh, if you, I, I've read the field reports of the scientists that first discovered the fossils there. Time Magazine did a story on it called Evolution's Big Bang, and uh, one, one of the paleontologists said, um, how much faster does, what I like to ask my evolutionary biology friends is, how much faster does it have to get before we stop calling it evolution, was his statement. <laughs> In any case, it's an extraordinary finding. And I was reading the field reports uh, from one of the paleontologists who made the first findings, and you could, you could hear the excitement in the way that they were written. It was scientific language, but he said, he said that the, the, the fossil forms looked alive on the wet um, mudstone. And, uh, and it was just, the, the extraordinary thing about these, these Chinese fossils is just how exquisite is the preservation and the almost photographic fidelity uh, many soft parts preserved as well as hard parts. This is a this is a fossil of this animalocarid. The claw was for a while thought to be a separate organism. They later realized no, it went with this guy. Um, the this is a, a the same creature we saw from the Burgess, a, 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 a crustacean called Waptia. The beautiful preservation of the head shield there. And there were many different phyla and subphyla, or uh, subphyla of arthropods documented, and then a whole bunch of amazing creatures. And I'm just going to kind of do a quick impressionistic flyby here with hyaliths and these filter feeding worms and uh, worms with bristles. And creature, this is a, uh, an animal form, not a plant, called Dynamiscus, and it was classified as a problematica because. It was so unique in its form and structure that people didn't know how to, they didn't know what phylum to put it in. Tenophore, this is one of my favorites because we have comb jellies in Puget Sound and um, the structure of these animals hasn't changed in 530 million years. It's just extraordinary. And the preservation is just unbelievable. So the Chinese find was incredible. One of the, the big headlining event was uh, in, I think it was 09, after the major uh, initial discoveries, but uh, the fish were discovered, uh, fossilized fish were discovered. They were previously unknown that early in the history of life, so even the chordates now could be placed in that early explosive period. Chordates are the phylum to which fish belong. So again, you have this pattern, and a couple things about the Chinese find that made, again, the mystery more mysterious was the breadth of representation, but also the suddenness. The redating of the Cambrian, the, the dating of the explosion shrunk from 40 down to 5 to 6 million years. And I think there was a, a, the count that we got when we looked through all the literature was there were about 16 new phylum, phyla in that, that short burst of, of, of time. So extraordinary. Uh, Richard Dawkins commenting on the Cambrian has said that it's as if the animal phyla were just planted there without any evolutionary history. And uh, so, uh, there was, a, by this time, another attempt to resolve the fossil mystery, and uh, this will be my last take on fossils, and then we'll move on. But it was uh, also called, it was another version of the artifact hypothesis, which said that 
The reason that the lower strata were not documenting the ancestral forms to the Cambrian is that they lacked, must have lacked hard parts, and they were probably small and microscopic. So the missing fossils could be explained as an artifact of incomplete preservation. The depositional environments weren't capable of preserving these the ancestors, which were presumably smaller and exclusively soft-bodied. Now, uh, there was another find in China that uh, I think has really challenged this attempt to explain away the missing fossils, and that is the discovery of some uh, fossilized embryos. Embryos are, by definition, soft. These embryos were, are probably sponge embryos, and uh, two Chinese scientists, who, well, a Chinese-American scientist and a Chinese scientist who worked on this um, concluded that by looking at these, in, the, these cells in cross-section, fossilized cells in cross-section, that they had little distinctive spicules, which are a distinctive uh, part of the anatomy of sponges. Uh, some people have disputed this interpretation, but they proposed that they were, they were some kind of uh, um, simple soft-bodied embryos of another kind. So the, the, here's the problem. If you can preserve an embryo, um, why can't you preserve a whole animal? Okay. These, now, here, I, maybe I, miss, uh, I miss, forgot to say something. These were found in, pre in a pre-Cambrian formation, okay, the Dushantu Shale. And so this is a formation where you'd, if, if there were ancestral forms present, you'd expect to preserve them unless the depositional environment wasn't favorable. But clearly the, the depositional environment was favorable because the, the rocks were preserving small, soft-bodied organisms. And so that version of the artifact hypothesis, which is, in a sense, the last one in a long string of attempts to explain away the missing fossils, has also gone down by, by, has gone by the boards. And the, the Chinese paleontologists in particular are very skeptical of this interpretation. So the, the mystery of the missing fossils, I think, is very much still with us. There's other issues we could discuss. I have a whole chapter on something called the Ediacaran in my book, but we could talk about that if you want later. I'm going to move on. The second and more significant mystery, I think, uh, uh, associated with the Cambrian explosion is not just the, the mystery of the missing fossils, though it's a real good story, and it's, it's a fun story to tell. Um, but the, the, the deeper mystery, I think, is the mystery of how you build an animal. And we can understand that today. Um, there's discoveries in other fields, in particular in molecular biology, I think have deepened our understanding of just what a severe problem that is. Because if we want to build an animal, we have to have new cell types. Uh, arthropods are different than sponges, and they've got a whole bunch of cell types that aren't present in those simpler forms of animal life. Um, chordates have a, a large number of new cell types. All new animal forms have different cell types, and cell types have within them dedicated proteins that accomplish specific functions. So if you have a gut cell, it will have a digestive enzyme. And so as you begin to kind of think of this in an informational way, you to do an informational accounting on this, you realize that if you want to build a new animal, you have to have new cell types. New cell types need new proteins, and therefore new proteins need new genetic information. The same issue I raised this morning in my talk. And so in the post-Watson and Crick world, we realize that, um, and these are some things that I covered conceptually this morning, that you want to build a new animal, you need a new, uh, you need a newer information. So the Cambrian explosion is not just an explosion of form, it's an explosion of information. And so the <clears throat> question that raises is really how does that information arise? Are you signaling me or just count? Uh, are you counting? Okay, very good. All right. So um, there's a big discussion. Uh, well, there's, there's two types of information that I, I want to talk about this morning or this afternoon. The, the origin of genetic information and the origin of what we could call epigenetic information, information that's stored beyond the genome. And both of these types of information, the origin of the, both these types of information, I think, create a significant challenge for neo-Darwinism. And the, intuitively, if we think about the mutational process, um, if we think about the fact, when we're talking about information 
in a genetic sense, we're talking about information that is specified. That is to say, the arrangement of the characters is necessary to perform a function. And, um, and so if you think about intuitively what happens when you begin to change things at random in a specified sequence of information, your, the intuition is, uh, well, let's put it as a question, is it more likely to degrade the information or to generate something novel and functional? Computer programmers who began to think about this, computer engineers in the 1960s at MIT, um, said this, this mutation mechanism is a way of generating a lot of new information. You might get lucky and change a few things that are going to still be functional. If you want to change a, a gene to produce a fundamentally new gene, that's a lot of, that, that, that's a lot of change. And you're more, more, going to be much more likely to degrade that information and probably you're going to degrade it in such a way that it's going to destroy function before you ever come up with anything fundamentally new. Now, um, I don't want to go into all the math of this because it's in the book, but I have a colleague um, out in Seattle who works at the, the lab affiliated with Discovery Institute called the Biologic Institute. His name is Doug Axe. And he's done a lot of very interesting work on the combinatorial problem that I discussed in the debate this morning. How many people were in the debate? Did I, was anyone not visiting, or anyone here to, okay. When we're talking about the origin of genetic information, there is a, a problem that arises that we have called the problem of combinatorial inflation. And, uh, yeah, here we go. And I used, and again, apologies to people who saw this this morning, but I used an illustration this morning from a bike lock. Uh, if you've got a, a bike lock with four dials, you've got four times, or you've got 10 times 10 times 10 possibilities, 10 to the fourth or 10,000 possible ways of arranging things. As systems like this get longer and longer, the number of possible combinations doesn't grow additively, it grows exponentially. So if we had a bike lock with 10 dials on it like this, uh, you'd have 10 to the 10 possibilities or 10 billion possibilities. Now it turns out that genes and proteins are, uh, uh, well, now, which is, if you're, if you're a thief trying to crack the lock and you've got the 10 dial lock in front of you, you've got a real problem because you can't sample enough of the combinations quickly enough to have a hope of, of it's going to be, let's put it this way, you might get lucky, but you're going to have to be really, really lucky. It's going to be much more likely than not that you will fail to find the, the combination by chance than it is that you're going to, than you're going to succeed depending on how long you have to look. But uh, the, if the number of combinations that need to be searched is big enough, you're going to need a lot of time. And um, now it, it turns out that both genes and proteins are also subject to this problem of combinatorial inflation. Genes make proteins, so you could do the analysis either way. But um, for a short polypeptide chain, you would have 10 sites, 20 possible amino acids, 20 to the 10th power, that's 10 trillion possible combinations. Um, for a, a chain 150 amino acids long, it's an unfathomably, unfathomably large number, 20 to the 150th power. Now, my colleague Doug Axe has done some very careful experimental work trying to uh, make an assessment of how rare or common the functional proteins are among that space of possibilities. And because we know in the case of proteins, it's not like a bike lock where there's only one functional combination. There are many functional proteins in that space of 10 to the 195th power. But as he's, uh, he, he did this very careful sampling technique called cassette or uh, site-directed mutagenesis and published a very important paper in the journal of Molecular Biology. And he's done a number of things following on from that. And his work followed similar work and results coming out of a lab in MIT under the direction of Robert Sauer. And so uh, a number of results have suggested that the, and basically that the that functional proteins are extremely rare among all the combinations, all the possible combinations of amino acids that, that are possible for a chain of a given length. And in a sense, Axe was asking, for every one of those, for every functional protein, how many non-functional strings of amino acids are there? The number he came up with for a protein of 
150 amino acids long was 1 over 10 to the 77th power. Okay? Now, I go into all the math in the book, but if you begin to think of the history of life, the estimate of the total number of organisms in the history of life is about 10 to the 40th. That includes bacteria. Um, almost all of those organisms would be bacteria. That'd be 10 to the 39th and maybe, you know, just a little bit of change for the everything else. But the bacteria aren't even really relevant to the Cambrian. But you begin to see that if you got maybe one new sequence per generation, which is an absurdly generous estimate because things in biology replicate with fidelity, mutations are the rare thing, you realize you're not going to get enough opportunities, you're not going to generate enough new sequences to search that space effectively. You're going to end up with you know, 10 to the 40th over 10 to the 77 is 1 over 10 to the 37, which is 10 trillion trillion trillion. One in 10. You'll, get, you'll search 1 10 trillion trillion trillionth of the space in the whole known history of life. And so the combinatorial problem is so severe that it suggests that the, a purely random search through combinatorial space is not going to generate even a single new gene or protein in the history of life. Okay? And so this, this suggests that the neo-Darwinian mechanism is inadequate to produce genetic information. That's, that's the payoff here. Okay? Now, there's a, a parallel result that is taking place in a an interesting subdiscipline of, of um, population genetics, where people are beginning to analyze the question of the origin of new genes using the population genetics models and equations. And the, this is, a, in a way, a, a result that supports the conclusion of ACTS in, in that it's showing that if you, beyond two or three coordinated mutations, it's going, the waiting times associated with generating new genetic traits blows up exponentially, okay? And so it, there's a whole series of papers that have been published since 04 up to the present that are exploring this problem of, it's basically looking at genes as complex adaptations and then saying, running, the analyzing uh, uh, the number of mutations necessary to produce a new genetic trait through the equations of population genetics. Now the equations of population genetics are the mathematical expression of neo-Darwinism. And they are suggesting that even very modest genetic change is going to take much more time than is available to the evolutionary process. So a way of thinking of that is that the neo-Darwinian math itself is suggesting that the the, the classical neo-Darwinian mechanism of mutation and selection is inadequate to generate new genetic information. So that's, in a sense, problem two with the mechanism of neo-Darwinian evolution. And that's at the genetic level. Now I'm going to try very rapidly, because it's late in the afternoon, and I'm tired, and I can tell some others are. But I want to I mention a, some things that are, uh, that are challenging the efficacy of the neo-Darwinian mechanism at a higher level, at the level of building body plans. There's a couple of German scientists, uh, uh, Christian Nusslein Wohlhard and Eric Wieschaus, who did some extremely important work in the 1980s, which, for which they won the Nobel Prize. And they were basically um, reverse engineering a fruit fly and mutating its genome to see what kind of deficits would result downstream in development. And then they would mutate things very early in development um, and later in development. But what they, they, and they made a number of great discoveries and they were able to map the Drosophila genome and it was fantastic science. There was one aspect of their work that had some very significant implications for evolutionary theory and it's not been as widely noted. And that is that the mutations they generated early in development were in, not just in, inevitably deleterious, they were always lethal. They produced embryonic lethals. And that's highly significant because as you begin to think about the process of embryological development where one fertilized cell becomes two, two become four, four become eight, and eventually the cells start to differentiate to form the different body plans. If you want to change or if to, for the evolutionary process, not to personify, 
to change one animal body plan into another, you have to change things early in the developmental trajectory. If you wait till later, you're going to mutate maybe some cells that are muscle cells or fingernail cells or something. You're not going to, to change the whole architecture of the animal. You've got to get it early, or the evolutionary process does. But this is the rub. Those early acting body plan mutations produce lethals. And if something dies, the evolutionary process terminates. And so this is a, a, a geneticist at the University of Georgia named John McDonald who calls this the, the, the great Darwinian paradox. He says that the kind of, this is my paraphrase, I've got the full quote in another slide, but I'm not going to fish it out. He basically says the kind of mutations you need for major body plan development you don't get. The kind you get, ones that happen later in isolated somatic cells, you don't need. Okay, so you have this, the, the, yes, mutations are ubiquitous, they're happening all the time, but they are not a silver bullet in evolution because the, the, the body plans require more than just any old kind of mutation. You need early acting beneficial body plan mutations and those we do not get. That combination, early acting and beneficial or early acting and adaptive, you don't get. Okay, you get lethals. All right, so that's a huge problem. Now, a, another related problem um, has to do with those circuits that I showed this morning. Oh, have I lost the... Um, <clears throat> talked about how to build a body plan, you have to... The, the, the developing embryo goes through a process of cell differentiation and organization, where different cell types are organized and they clump together to form specific organs and tissues. Now, there's a developmental biologist at Caltech named Eric Davidson, who is for now nearly 40 years mapped these developmental trajectories. He works on a model system called uh, sea urchins. And what he's discovered is that, as they, they, is that this developmental process is under a tight con genetic control and that as he's mapped that genetic control, he's produced diagrams like this to describe exactly what's going on. Essentially, there are uh, networks of genes and protein signaling molecules which turn on other signaling molecules, which turn on other signaling molecules. It's a cascading effect, and it's tightly choreographed. And when you map it all out, it, it forms an integrated circuit. So the, the developmental trajectory of animals is under the control of a, what he calls, they're called a developmental um, gene regulatory networks. Okay? Now, Davidson has grown extremely skeptical about neo-Darwinism. In fact, he, in one place with uh, Valentine, calls it a catastrophic error. And the reason he's skeptical is that, like all integrated circuits, these systems are subject to the constraints problem of engineering. The constraints problem of engineering is that the more functionally integrated a system, more tightly integrated a system, the more difficult it is to perturb any part of the system without defect to the whole. And what he's found is that uh, as you D disrupt these, these developmental gene regulatory networks, these, these, uh, these circuits, the, the effects on development are always catastrophic, okay? Which raises a question for evolution. If you want to build a new body plan from a pre-existing animal form with its own body plan, you have to alter the genetic circuitry. You have to alter these, these developmental gene regulatory networks. But what the experimental evidence shows is that altering them is invariably catastrophic. So you have another similar problem to the early acting developmental mutation problem. And so Davidson is one of the many voices saying, hey, we've got to move beyond neo-Darwinism to some other kind of evolutionary theory. He has no uh, interest or support or sympathies for intelligent design, believe me. I'm not wanting to portray him that way. But he has been very, very critical of the standard model. Um, now, the last, so that's four problems so far. Mecha problems with the mechanism. The problem, the combinatorial inflation, the problem of waiting times and complex adaptations, the problem of early acting body plan mutations, and the problem of the inability of these genetic circuits to be mutated effectively. The last problem that I discuss in the book with the mechanism, under the second section of the book is about how to build an animal, is the problem of, of epigenetic information. Um, for the, a long time, many biologists thought that the 
the information in DNA controlled the whole, it was the whole show. The, the developmental program for the animal wholly resided in DNA. We now know that there are lots of other important sources of information that affect animal development, and they are not all genetic. They're not all even digital. They have, they're more of an analog in character. And a, a few sources of such information that I discuss in the book. Um, one is the particular arrangement of, tar of, of, of targets inside the membrane of a developing organism that um, are necessary for certain proteins that are involved in development to do their job. Um, in, in fruit flies, there's, there are two proteins, bicoid and nanos. And for bicoid and nanos to do the right job, to, to enable the development to occur properly of a fruit fly, they have to be in very specific spatial locations. And there are targets or other structures that attract those molecules to those places. And those targets precede the expression of genes. They're transmitted from embryo to embryo. And there are many such sources of information. There's a sugar code on the outside of the cell that is transmitting information that affects how cells interact with each other in development. The structure of cytoskeletons is crucially important to development. Cytoskeletons are all made of proteins, which are gene products, but the proteins are all tubulin, and they're all the same structure, and it's the arrangement of those tubulin proteins, like building blocks, that determines a lot of developmental trajectory. So there's a lot of sources of epigenetic information that are important to animal development. Now here's the rub. Um, if you want to build an animal, you can't just mutate DNA. Because DNA will, in the best of cases, produce proteins. But proteins alone will not an animal make. You have to have these higher levels of, 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 of organization, structure, and information as well. And so, if, but what's the problem? Neo-Darwinism says that the the source of innovation and form is at the lowest level of the biological hierarchy, at the level of the genes. You mutate genes, you get new innovations in form that can, that can build animals. We now know that's not true. You can mutate DNA indefinitely until the cows come home without respect to probabilistic limits or the calculations of Dr. Axe, and in the best of cases, you will still get a protein. But the proteins have to be arranged into higher order structures, they have to be arranged into cell types. Cell types have to be arranged into tissues, tissues into organs, organs and tissues into body plants. And that is not all under genetic control. Genes are necessary to all those processes, thus my emphasis on genetic information this morning. But the genetic information is not sufficient. And therefore, if body plan morphogenesis depends on, if, if, if mutating DNA, the neo-Darwinists, sorry, let me put it this way, the neo-Darwinists want to say that mutations in DNA are responsible for body plan morphogenesis. But we now know that higher orders of information not subject to the, those mutational processes are also necessary. And so the, the mechanism is just the wrong kind of tool for the job. It's, it's, I think this is, a, we're, I think because of epigenetic information, the theory is at a, a point of fundamental impasse. And when I mentioned this morning the work of Muller and Newman in their 2004, 2003 book, on the origin of organismal form, much of their skepticism about neo-Darwinism and its absence of, as they put it, it has no theory of the generative. It can't explain the origin of form. Much of that de derived from their own work in epigenetics. Okay, so those are five independent um, mechanistic problems or problems with the neo-Darwinian mechanism. Now, and I'll, I'll get off the stage here. You've been very patient. Um, the third part of my book. Is, uh, has a section divider, a little trilobite picture, and the, it says, um, the, the, the heading is, after Darwin what? And really I should say, after neo-Darwinism what? And there I have a couple of chapters looking at the new models of evolutionary theory that are being proposed. And one of the ways you know that a theory has reached the end of the road is not just what people say about it, it's what they do. And these are, and I'm talking about mainstream evolutionary biologists, and I look at six major new theories of biological evolution that are now being proposed, developed in the literature, and I have some very respectful engagement. There's many aspects of those different theories that are meritorious, 
But in the end, I find each of them deficient because there's a pattern. And that is that they, um, they end up presupposing the existence of either genetic or epigenetic information in order to, to make progress. There's some really, uh, uh, Stuart Newman, uh, one, of the th one of the scientists I just mentioned, is a really interesting theory of self-organization. And he identifies a number of, of genuine self-organizational processes. But I show in the chapter that each of them, he also presupposes a universal genetic toolkit that would be available. So he presupposes genetic information. And I show in the chapter that the processes of self-organization that he identifies depend upon pre-existing sources of epigenetic information as well. So it, like the work that Ard does on viruses, it's a real process of of self-assembly, but only if you first have the genetic and the epigenetic information. So, uh, so in a way, it's, pro it's progress in some ways, but it's still this deeper question that's necessary to resolve to explain the origin of an animal still remains. Another scientist for whom I have a great deal of respect is uh, Jim Shapiro at the University of Chicago, and he's got some really neat work he's done on how uh, mutations are not random at all. And he's broken with the neo-Darwinians on this question. He's still working within a naturalistic framework, but he's, he says there's lots of processes of, that are essentially, they're, 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 um, the mutations are occurring in response to pre-programmed adaptive capacity triggered by environmental changes and cues. The question that, should, and, and I think his science is fantastic, but the question he doesn't address is from whence comes the pre-programmed adaptive capacity. Okay. I think one of the interesting things about the discussion Ard and I were having this morning was, was um, essentially a question of the, of the locus of design. And you saw that Ard was comfortable placing it at the, with the fine-tuning. I was comfortable talking about it with the origin of life. Ard talked about it with the origin of human consciousness and spiritual. Well, it, it, I think this, this issue comes up in biology, and I think there's a, a lot of room for a lot of different ways of conceptualizing this and, and understanding design, but I think you know what, what Shapiro's doing is very suggestive. You know, that if you're talking about pre-programmed adaptive capacity, that may be a locus of design. Anyway, in the book then at the end, I develop a case for intelligent design using much the same logic as I discussed this morning, but applying it to different indicators of designs design. We have circ in addition to digital information, which by the way, we've been talking about just that kind of intuitive response. We have Siegfried showed a wonderful video yesterday in his talk, and he talked about the impact that that had on a lot of his students when they just see these processes at work. I have long felt that, you know, to me it's a stop-press moment in the history of biology when we realize that digital code is running the show. I mean, that is, that ought to awaken something in us. But in addition to that, in this book, I look at other hallmarks or indicators of design in the Cambrian event, both in the pattern of fossil evidence, the top-down pattern, the sudden appearance, but also in the animals themselves. We have digital code, we have circuitry, and we have a hierarchically organized or, uh, system of information expression and processing where epigenetic information is controlling the expression and function of genetic information. We have circuitry doing the same. It's a, it's a hierarchically organized informational system. And I think we have only one example in the history, of, well, it, one example in our knowledge base of, uh, right, let me put it this way, there's only one known cause for, for, or, for systems that have that feature of hierarchical organization of information, and that is intelligence. So using the same principles of reasoning I used in Signature in the Cell and in my talk this morning, I argue that that's a feature that, that is suggestive of design, and I, I probably go further and say I think the design is, intelligent design is the best explanation. So that's the sketch of the book, and I left some time for questions, so thank you, I'll stop. <laughs>